Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our ninth broadcast for Maccabean Uprising. And my name is Dominic. So um, this is, uh, as I usually say before each broadcast, this one is actually going to be very interesting. And, uh, and every time I mean it, I promise. So I'm going to say it again. This, this one is going to be especially interesting. So I hope that uh, you stay tuned and listen uh, and uh, enjoy it. But as always, uh, please let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection and implored thy help or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, and in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm always a little bit nervous about my sound, so just give me a second to check and make sure that it's on the right way. It uh, looks like it is, so I'm going to pretend like it is. Okay. Um... All right. Uh, I'm assuming that everyone can hear me. If you can't, could someone uh, send me a, a message on Facebook and let me know? I have my window open, so I'll read it. Thank you very much. So great. Um, uh, before we start, there's always a couple uh, things to kind of uh, go over first, but I, I definitely want to announce that tomorrow is the great feast day of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. So that was in uh, 1854, Pope Pius IX. He um, decreed officially the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And of course, that means that Our Lady was conceived without the stain of original sin. And this was um, widely believed in the church by the faithful uh, for centuries. But um, it was uh, as in until 1854 that it was, it was officially proclaimed. So tomorrow is the feast day of the Immaculate Conception. Of course, it's a holy day of obligation as well. Definitely mention that. And then, as always, before we start, I always want to um, promote um, uh, the folders that um, we have, uh, hard copy information that we have available to you. Now, let's see if I can find that. Well, you know what? Before I do, um, I should probably go ahead and uh, just announce to people who are maybe tuning in for the first time what it is that they're watching. So uh, my name is Dominic again, hello, and this is Maccabean Uprising. So for about two and a half years, I've been working on this project and the whole overarching goal of it, the, the, the reason for the whole thing is to, to demonstrate one simple principle. And actually that, that has uh, you know, a tremendous amount of, of subsidiary and smaller um, implications and, 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 and studies and, and areas of interest. But the overarching principle, the one principle, is that it's that of something called typology, or you could say uh, prefigurement or foreshadowing. And uh, this is something that's been uh, widely used in the church ever since the, the days of the early church. In fact, our Lord actually used it in the Gospels when he referred to the serpent being mounted on the, on the stick in the desert and how that was a foreshadowing of him on the cross. Um, so, um, but this is, this is uh, taking it, I guess, to a, a different level, because what we're saying here is that the entire Old Testament history of the Israel, from the very start up until um, the end of the Old Testament, so that'd be from the book of Genesis all the way up to the books of the Maccabees, the whole history of the, of the Israel and then what would become known as the Jews at the end of the Old Testament, that whole body of history is actually one continuous, seamless, and, and chronological um, prefigurement or type of the church's history, the Catholic church's history. So as the story of Israel progresses through the Old Testament, you can find corresponding events in church history that take place at the same time, chronologically speaking. And so, um, you know, that's an incredible thing. And what you're seeing on the screen here is just a little promo video I did on my YouTube channel, which, by the way, you'll find our internet sites below on the scrolling bar. Um, so um, right now it's going through the eight major time periods of both the Old Testament and church history. And it kind of gives you the, uh, the correspondence between the books in the Old Testament and what time period they represent in church history, because there's a chronological link between them. So then um, 
uh, and then at the end of the cycle of, of, of time periods, you'll find our internet site. So you can check that out on YouTube. We have a whole lot of different kinds of videos there. We have uh, videos for every major time period and focusing in on major events of church history, which have, again, parallels in the Old Testament. And then, um, you know, we have all kinds of summaries and, and in-depth analysis and, and some shorter videos like the one you're watching right now. So, um, and what is, of course, uh, one, of the major, uh, one of the major themes or one of the major uh, subjects that, that is of interest to us right now in, in the system of parallels is the end of the Old Testament and how it seems very much to parallel the end of church history, which looks, uh, well, <laughs> excuse me, how it parallels the... Um, the events of Vatican II and the in, uh, implementation of the Novus Ordo right, and all the things that happened uh, after that and up until our present day. Um, and um, so um, that, that has tremendous uh, meaning for us now because it really sheds some light on the nature of the crisis in the church. So um, we've been focusing in on that ever since the third or fourth broadcast. And um, we have, again, videos on that on YouTube. So um, with that in mind... Uh, or with, with, with that done, excuse me, let's go on to what I want to promote here is um, our folders. Because not only do we have information on the internet, we also have, oh, I just played that. We also have uh, information that you can receive uh, via uh, snail mail or hard copy material, which is something, what is this doing to me? I'm sorry, everybody. Try this again. Okay, there it is. Great. Uh, again, hard copy material that you can look at and it doesn't have to be on a screen. So um, we put together a folder and it has, you know, uh, pouches on the inside. And, and basically what we have in there is a summary of the major events of church history and how they are paralleled by the major events of the Old Testament. And also as many details as we can kind of cram in without making it um, too onerous and too difficult and too uh, confusing. So we have a number of brochures in there. Um, now, what we're going to cover tonight is an extension of what we covered last Friday. And last Friday, oh good, I'm, uh, I'm getting some messages. Let me make sure my sound is working before I go on any further. Excuse me. Okay, it looks like it's working. Good. Um, so like I was saying, um, what we're going to cover this Friday is an extension of what we covered last Friday. And last Friday, we covered the subject of the book of the Apocalypse, which, um, of, of, you know, it's a major, major subject area. It's of intense interest. And um, the reason why uh, I feel confident to cover that is because the, the parallels, the, our whole project is, is based on the concept of these parallels between church history and the Old Testament. And when you go through uh, the parallels and you see that they're there, like I said, in a seamless, chronological, continuous, step-by-step -step kind of way, it's clearly the work of God. Because, um, you know, um, and le well, if you check it out for yourself, I think you'll be convinced. I know you'll be convinced that it's clearly the work of God. Only God could have, could have orchestrated something on that scale and of such beauty and such magnitude and, and glory. Um, so, um, and, and, so, um, but when you go through those parallels, at the very end, um, there is uh, a very strong uh, correlation between what is known as the abomination of desolation in the Old Testament, books of the Maccabees, and the new rite of Paul VI, uh, which is, could be also be, uh, called the Novus Ordo rite. And so um, that correlation has, uh, it's loaded with, uh, with, um, with potential and with, uh, with um, strings attached that you can grab onto uh, handles because... Um, the abomination of desolation is a term that our Lord uses to describe the end times. And it's also um, something that's in the book of Daniel with many prophecies associated with it. So what we've done is, is wondered if we could take that parallel and um, apply the events of the Novus Ordo, uh, right, and the events surrounding the Vatican II and such to the prophecies of Daniel. And it really makes the book of uh, some of the prophecies in Daniel just kind of explode. So um, that was something we covered a couple broadcasts ago. And then because the book of Daniel is an apocalyptic book and because it has all kinds of ties with the book of the apocalypse, um, they all prophesize things about the end, um, you can use the book of Daniel as a, as a foundation for understanding different parts of the book of the apocalypse. Um, all of this, again, is based on these parallels. So um, 
I, I can't go over it all. It's just way too much to go over right now. But we can go back and find in previous broadcasts, you can see what I'm talking about and watch those. Or, or send me an email. Um, our, my email address is going to pop at the bottom of the screen eventually. Um, so last Friday, we went over the Book of the Apocalypse, uh, which is uh, that brochure that is going to be coming up next on your screen. It's going to be included in that folder. And um, so... Um, uh, and then tonight, I mentioned that we're going to go further into the Book of the Apocalypse. Um, uh, I guess my, my brain is a little scattered tonight. I'm trying to keep it together. <laughs> but going back to this folder again, uh, if you do want one of these folders, all you have to do is email. Just email uh, maccabeanuprising at gmail.com, and I'll send you one. It's completely free. It's a great thing to have and to hold so that you can reference uh, the, the concept of these parallels and, and the broad strokes of how they work without having to turn on your, your computer all the time. Or you can, you can give them to people who aren't computer literate. It's a great way for them to understand or see the basic uh, gist of what's going on with these beautiful uh, prefigurements of church history by the Old Testament. So again, email me. Uh, I send, I've sent half of a th 500, 600 of them out so far. Most of them in America, but a, a good chunk of them has gone also overseas. And again, it's completely free, so just email me. All right, I'm probably going on too long about some things. But um, okay, let's move on now to tonight's broadcast. So let's start, I think. Right, good. All right. Um, so like I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, that um, what we covered last Friday was an understanding of key parts of the book of the Apocalypse um, based on the book of Daniel, which was in turn based on the prefigurement of church history by the Old Testament. And what we were able to really kind of draw out as something that is um, uh, quite striking is a large heart of the book of the apocalypse which would be chapters 11 12 13 and also 17 with uh, 14 and 15 and 16 in there as well but not quite as solidly as uh 12 to 12 13 and 17 and that would be the, the 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 red dragon the woman the whore of babylon um it would also be um the the seven headed beast out of the sea and the two horned lamb that comes out of the earth and all of this is uh you could we could grab a hold of again because we have a starting place now we have we have a definite link between the, the right of Paul the sixth and and the um, abomination of desolation and again go back you know if you need to be convinced about how how convincing this is go back to our previous broadcasts um, because of the complexity of the book of the apocalypse and because of just the mystery and and the awe of of what Saint John wrote how profound it is. Um, well, first of all, by the way, I'm not claiming to understand, you know, the book of the apocalypse in any great detail. Um, it is, it is more mysterious than we can, I think we'll ever know on earth for sure. I think, you know, in heaven, um, we'll, sh we'll, we'll know just how intricate and how detailed and how, um, how glorious God was as he wrote down things in scripture. I mean, how ev every single word in letter is meaningful probably on multiple levels. I mean, it's something, and I'm starting to get a better idea of just how much I don't know about the book of the Apocalypse and also the rest of sacred scripture as well. Um, but that being said, um, there are some things we can kind of say about it, and there are some patterns and some deeper ways to understand it, and that's what I want to go over tonight. Um, and so the key thing I want to focus, focus on in on tonight is the imagery in the book of the Apocalypse. Um, what we what we looked at last Friday was the fulfillment of the apocalypse um, in actual history um, because of the specific details given in the text, and that would be the seven kings of the great city on seven hills and, and the whole thing. Um, so what you're seeing here right now on the screen is a summary video of the uh, our, our video, um, which you can find on YouTube. It's called The Seven-Headed Beast Out of the Sea. Um, and then... Um, uh, we also, like I mentioned earlier, we have a brochure to the same effect, and it's included in that folder. So here's a, a look at the brochure here. All right. Uh, and then um, what the brochure also does show is not only the seven-headed beast out of the sea, but it also shows the two-horned lamb that follows that. And that would be the, the, the beast that came out of the earth. Now, if you noticed, the seven-headed beast came out of the sea, and the two-horned lamb came out of the earth. There's 
there's there's meaning there and we're going to cover that tonight right so we're going to talk about the earth the sea the sun the stars the moon the trees all of those different images in the apocalypse and and very probable um meanings for them so um so that's what we're going to go on to tonight but um um i don't want to uh i don't want to go on until uh we have a somewhat of a handle of where we are here in church history so uh, if you can see on your screen there, uh, the brochure, um, we, we have it that the, uh, the period of the Seven Kings starts with the Lateran Treaty, and it ends when Benedict XVI resigns uh, on February 11, 2013, which occurred exactly 84 years after the signing of the Lateran Treaty. So there's all kinds of amazing um, events, I guess, what's the word? Um, not coincidences, because they're not coincidences, but all kinds of perfect fits, I guess, would be a good way of describing it. How, how perfectly those events do fit the text of the book of the Apocalypse. For instance, the book of the Apocalypse talks about one of these seven heads is mortally wounded, and his wound is healed. And that same king whose wound is healed goes on to have his image adored um, by the people of the, quote, earth. And so, you know, you can, we can see that that would very likely obviously be john paul ii right and um and also how the two-horned lamb that follows the seven-headed beast and that two-horned lamb very much appears to be benedict and francis together the first dual quote papacy in the history of the church right um how um that two-horned lamb causes us to adore or venerate or worship the image of the beast who is mortally wounded and whose wound whose death was healed and that's exactly what we see in history. That's we have uh, is a Benedict who started the cause of canonization, and Francis who actually uh, canonized uh, John Paul II, um, causing uh, the earth to adore his image. And then the apocalypse also says is that the, the people of the earth who adore his image are are lost, are damned. Okay, so if we're right about the interpretation of the book of the apocalypse. Um, then, um, you know, considering John Paul II a saint is very dangerous, very dangerous indeed. Um, that's, that's, I guess we'll leave that for a few, future point um, of commentary in a later video. But, um, so anyway, this is, this is the period of time we're looking at. And keep this in mind, because when we go through the book of the Apocalypse, based, and we're, we're going to look at the imagery that's used, um, the eclipse of the sun, the moon turns red, the blood, the stars fall from the sky, uh, the trees are burnt up from the earth, the earth is corrupted by the people, um, there's there's a there's a whole bunch of imagery that's used here that when we when we get a better understanding of what the images are, um, then you can really see uh, the apocalypse unfold before us in the events of Vatican II and following. Right? It, it makes a very much more understandable uh, text in terms of how you can see now how this is a metaphorical description for Vatican II and the destruction of the traditional uh, mass and the traditional faith of the, of the church. So that's kind of like, that's the whole goal tonight. So moving on here, um, let's see where we're at next. All right. Okay, uh, to start off and to give us a, a, a shoe in into this topic, to give us a, a, a place to kind of poke our nose under the tent so we can get in and understand, understand us further. Let's start with the book of Daniel again. Now, the book of Daniel um, is the, if not the major uh, prophetical book of the Old Testament. It is you know, beautiful uh, prophecies that are mysterious um, and very likely have multiple fulfillments. But um, most, a lot of the prophecies in the book of Daniel deal with four empires of the Old Testament, right? And the, and the, the beauty about the book of Daniel, the Dewey Reams uh, Bible footnotes from the book of Daniel give us the Old Testament fulfillments of those prophecies so we know what we're looking at. So when you do read the book of Daniel and then when you read the, um, the footnotes, it's, we're going to look at, right now we're going to look at chapter 7, okay? Um, it talks about uh, four beasts that come out of the sea, all right? And then we're told in the footnotes that those four beasts are four pagan empires that arise um, during the history of the, of the Jews or the Israelites. And what you're seeing on your screen there were those four empires, and they would be the Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And that how each of those empires um, falls on the heels of the last one, and they do specific things to God's people. Now, um, the, the fact that they come out of the sea is very significant because... Obviously, an empire doesn't literally come out of the literal sea. 
the C is a metaphorical image. It's a term used to describe something, right? And so what's going on is that um, the Old Testament, uh, the Jews or the Israelites, had a way of metaphorically understanding their world. And they would consider themselves to be the earth. And they would see the, the sea as the, the amorphous blob of pagan nations that surrounded them. So um, that, that's why you'll have the Babylonian Empire come out of the sea, followed by the Persian Empire out of the sea, the Greek Empire out of the sea. They just came out of what, from the Israelites' point of view, they were just a, a blob of non-believing pagans who didn't have God's word or God's commandments and didn't follow anything about God's laws. They just all worshipped false gods. The fact that it was one false god or the other makes no difference, really. They're all just part of the sea, right? A very intimidating, large, vast, dangerous, scary, uncharted sea. And so they all came out of the sea. Um, and again, uh, the Israelites would be the earth. Now, um, let me just, there's, this is, by the way, this is going to be, I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, and I apologize. Um, in order to, to view this broadcast with, you know, when, uh, discuss with me these, uh, this, these terms and these concepts, um, I'm not claiming anything specific here. This, this is probably um, an area of my personal study and understanding that is least concrete in terms of, um, you know, uh, scripture. Um, uh, and, and I should say uh, least concrete of all the things that I present on my, on my channels. Okay. Um, there's a lot more that I, I understand about scripture a lot less than this, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that, um, this is, uh, this is more poetic than anything, right? So take it that way. Um, I'm not claiming any definite, uh, interpretation here of these terms, just very likely ones and just a way of kind of, of approaching this in a different way. Right. Um, and that's, that's really the goal of this is this, this broadcast is to help us approach, um, these, these apocalyptical terms in a, in a more poetic, um, metaphorical way than just a, you know, a, a specific, you know, it's the actual literal sea or the actual literal sun, right? Because, um, it's very likely that it's not right based on old Testament evidence. So, um, um so going back to what I was talking about from the book of Daniel, um, uh, and, um, and uh, the way the Israelites understood their world, these, these metaphorical terms, um, th these, these terms are given to uh, them and to us primarily, first of all, in the book of Genesis, where it talks about the creation of the earth and the sea and the, and the lights, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all these things. So these images are given meaning first and foremost in the physical realm. So we have, we understand what the sun is because we can see it, we experience it. The earth, we see it, experience it, the sea also. And so the characteristics of those things are transferred over to this metaphorical understanding of the new creation, of the new, uh, a, a new creation, which would be, um, in the Old Testament, it would be the, the nation of Israel as God's chosen people, the new earth, and then the sea around it. But because the history of the church is a complete is completely parallel and prefigured by the Old Testament. We have course, uh, correlations uh, in the same uh, exact space, spots in the same ways and characteristics as um, in the Old Testament as we have in church history. So you can directly draw conclusions from the Old Testament to church history because of the chronological parallels, and that's important. All right. So. Um, um, so I haven't established, at least in a, in a poetic way, you know, what the sea is and what the earth is. So then we can go on to see um, all the other ones as well, or at least a lot of other ones. And if not all of them, uh, just gain an understanding of how to how to approach it in, in general. You know, and then you can you can go into the uh, scriptures and, and kind of see for yourself. Right. But I'm um, here. This is a, a little video just to, you know, the earth and the sea. Um, and then we have. Uh, uh oh, where am I at here? All right. So I have a series of slides that are just going to help us to um, conceptualize these these terms and understand um, their their characteristics. All right. So you know the sea. I, I mentioned this before. It's vast and expansive. It's full of mystery and danger, and it's always changing and 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 um, and moving. So that is the pagan world to uh, to God's people, and. To any devout Catholic or even, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, to a devout uh, Jew, um, the, the doings and workings of the secular world are somewhat of a mystery because hopefully we're not immersed in them, right? I mean, um, it seems that the more devout one becomes, the less in touch and in tune one is with the secular world. And so 
that is uh, an understanding of how the secular world, which is, would be the sea, you see, how that would become increasingly of a mystery to us and full of danger. You know, um, those of us who have children who are trying to raise them uh, as devout Catholic children, keep them away from secular influences. And to those children, it's a big mystery to them. I mean, those, those children that never were immersed in them before. Like, you know, I grew up very secular, um, but, um, but raising children who aren't, I've, I'm learning through their eyes that it's a great mystery. But it's also, we you know, try to express to them the danger and the uncertainty of that, of that world. So there's the sea. And then the earth, of course, is uh, is is juxtaposed juxtaposed to the to the to the sea, and that by by contrast is stable, sure, and solid. It's somewhere where you can stand firm. You know where you're standing. It's hopefully not going to shift uh, below your feet. And the earth is a place where you can grow things. This is where crops will grow, trees will grow, animals will graze. Now there are sea animals as well, but they're of a different nature than the animals of the earth, of course, as we all recognize. Um, so the earth is a place where um, there seems to be order uh, out of the chaos and, and much more. So, and you know, I'm only mentioning a couple of these characteristics, but you know, they're, they're common to us all. So really, I don't need to really uh, tell you what the earth is. Obviously, you know what it is for yourself. But what I'm trying to do is just kind of expound upon the way to think metaphorically. Okay, and then from there, once that, that element is, is in your mind, then you can apply that in your, to your own understanding of the sea and to the, to the earth and to the sun. So here's the sun. The sun obviously is a, a thing of tremendous importance to all of us because without it, we would all die. And it gives us light and, and warmth, um, but it only shines during the day. At night, we lose the sun, right? So now moving on to um, the next uh, celestial body. By the way, uh, the sun is in the heavens and so is the moon. Now, the moon only has its light from the sun. It doesn't have its own light. So it's only reflecting the sun's light. And it shines during the night, although you, you can see it during the day sometimes. So there will be the moon. It could be a full moon or a quarter moon or a new moon. And you can see it during the day, but it shines at night when you need it the most. Now, of course, the moon goes through phases. So sometimes there is no moon, which is a very dark night. Now, um... Uh, I was listening to a podcast. Uh, uh, it was non-related to the faith. It was simply a podcast about medieval times. And I, I forget the channel and I forget uh, what it was called, but it was very scholarly and it was very um, well done. It was very long, a couple hours long. And I'd sit up late at night and just listen and um, learning, trying to learn a lot about any any aspect of history as I, can, as I can, because now I know that it's paralleled by the Old Testament. So it's all very interesting. And what I came upon was the, the professor in, in the podcast telling me that the, the, the medieval people had a very metaphorical way of understanding their world as well, uh, much like the Israelites did. And what he mentioned specifically was the sun and the moon. And it caught my attention instantly because of these, of these terms and how they seem to work. So um, he said that the medievals had an understanding that, that the church, or perhaps it's the papacy itself, was the sun was the sun. And you can see that um, we even have these, ter these, these phrases. We'll say, we'll say things like the light of truth. May the light of truth shine on, etc., etc. So light and truth already seem to be correlated. And um, it is the papacy in particular that is the guardian of the truth. And, and of course, the church through the papacy because of the promise that our Lord made to St. Peter. He who hears you hears me, the rock, the rock of our faith. St. Peter, the papacy, gives us the truth. It's papal pronouncements like the Immaculate Conception that we know for sure can be true. And it's, it's the divine truth guaranteed by the Holy Ghost through the papacy. So if the papacy is, for instance, the sun giving us light, giving us light to the, to the people of, quote, the earth, you see, um, then... Um, then um, the moon, something that re would reflect that light, could be, and there, there are multiple ways of looking at this, but in my mind, one of the things could be, uh, at, at the time, in medieval time, you'd have Catholic governments, Catholic kings, um, and what they would do is, um, hopefully, they would reflect the light of the church through their own policies, through their own um, laws and rules and, and, and actions. And in doing so, what they would do is, they, they don't have any light of their own. All they can do is reflect the light from the sun. 
but they can provide extra light to the people. Now, recognize that during church history, we've had some some um, uh, popes that were much better than others. We've had saint popes, and we've had non-saint popes. We've had anti-popes in church history as well. And if we can look at the papacy as the sun, then... The, the times when the papacy would cease to shine, for instance, if it was an anti-pope, during Avignon would be a good example, right? The Avignon papacy, would, everyone was confused. It was very dark. Um, no one knew what was going on. But to the extent that the, uh, set, the, the, the governments of the medieval world would still reflect Catholic truth, they could provide a light in the darkness. It's not a primary light, but it's a reflection at least of some light that they're providing. Now, and also recognize there could be times when um, the sun wasn't shining, nor the moon was shining, and that would be a very dark night. So, in that kind of way, we can see how, through church history and even through our modern times, the sun and the moon would operate in metaphor. Um, and just to substantiate this whole concept even further, um, remember our Lord is called the New Adam. Our Lady is called the New Eve. The book of the, the Gospel of St. John starts off with the words, in the beginning, right? So we have already a throwback to the beginning of the Old Testament. Um, the, the church is a new creation in Christ. It's, it's a new creation. So you have the first creation, which is the order of the physical. The new creation in Christ is the order of, or excuse me, I should say the order of the natural. And, the, and we have the church is a creation in the, in the order of the supernatural. So we have, um, we have divine graces now being bestowed and a, and a restoration to us uh, through the church, a forgiveness of our sins, and the chance again to enter through the gates of paradise, through heaven, which was closed to Adam and Eve. And so, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that's probably not uh, foreign to anyone who's listening. Everyone recognizes this concept because it's very Catholic. It's talked about by great saints and doctors so, uh, of the church and, and, and saints. So here we go is, is just more substantiation of these terms, the sun, the moon, the earth, and the stars. You, if, if they have a natural meaning, and if the church is the new creation, right, then it makes sense that you can apply these to the church or to the world of the New Testament, where you have uh, the church as the, as the new earth and the seas are the secular uh, places of the world. Um, and, so, um, and so that's the moon. And of course, and is going through that same kind of thinking, the next logical thing to think about in, in the heavens, so to speak, would be the stars. Now, I have to admit that, you know, uh, I've strained my brain uh, trying to think about what I think this means. And it, I guess it's not very important that we get the exact meaning of it, but we understand the concept. That's really what's really important here. Um, and if, if we think about um, our, our, our Catholic life, you know, if we think about um, when we contemplate the faith, contemplate the church in, in our world today, contemplate our experiences of the church in the world today, or of recent history, or even of distant history, um, we can see these elements in our minds without actually seeing the term, the moon or the stars, you know. Um, we, we can kind of um, get a sense of that already. Like, for instance, um, stars are fixed in place, right, and they're used for guidance. Well... Um, what do we have in our Catholic world that would correlate with that? Well, you could say possibly church doctrine. I don't know, right? But they're fixed doctrines and they don't change. That's the whole concept of doctrine is that it's sure. Um, it's, it's, and it's something we guide our lives by, our faith. We guide. Or you could also say um, priests and bishops, right? And there's evidence for both. Um, we're going to go into, a little bit later, we're going to go into the uh, prophecies and words of Our Lady of La Salette, who uses the same terms in her messages. And so, because she seems to be speaking in apocalyptic language, she also gives us clues about what it means. And we'll go into that later on. But one of the things I'm just thinking of right now is when she says that the old serpent will drag the priests who are like wandering stars. And so she'll say that the priests, because they have lost their way, are like wandering stars. Well, that's interesting. Um, and so a star is supposed to be fixed, but if it moves around, it's a wandering star. Now, wandering stars have a, have a, do have a technical name, and those are actually called planets. So the planets are wandering stars because they appear to look like stars, but they move throughout the sky. Well, Our Lady says that the priests who have lost their way are like wandering stars. 
and you can't use them for guidance because they'll move around throughout the sky. And you, if you if you're trying to uh, you know, uh, trying to get to a destination on a horizon somewhere and use the stars for guidance. If you pick that wandering star, you'll get lost. Well, if you are a Catholic and you're trying to get to heaven and you're trying to find out um, what to do, what to believe, how to behave, and if you pick the wrong priest, an unholy priest, you might not go to heaven. You will have picked a wrong star. You will become lost. So, um, and that works for a bishop as well. So, let's see here. Now, moving on to the... Uh, a very big term in the book of the apocalypse that's used many, many times is an earthquake, right? Now, traditionally, I've seen, and this is mostly Protestants, but a lot of Catholics as well, um, will read the apocalypse and simply think that the end will come when a lot of earthquakes happen. And there are people who are s simply looking for earthquake increases in earthquakes. Not to say that that's not true. I, I think that there are physical manifestations of the apocalypse as well. And I think you might actually see a rise in earthquakes towards the end. But I think that the primary meaning here is metaphorical because of the nature of the book. It's apocalyptic literature, like the book of Daniel. Um, in the book of the apocalypse, it talks about a seven-headed beast out of the sea. Nobody thinks that's literal. Everyone understands that to be a metaphor. So it's not too hard of a stretch then to think that the whole book might be a metaphor, primarily, primarily. Again, I'm not saying that, that, that there won't be earthquakes. You know, I'm not, I don't, God's not limited to one interpretation only, but, um, this can be understood, uh, by looking at the, the nature of an earthquake, right? So an earthquake, it shakes the earth, obviously it will rearrange the ground. So after the earthquake is over, um, different, like, you know, if, uh, if the plates, um, shift in a certain way, then you might have, um, two, uh, two locations that were previously right next to each other might be a mile apart, or that's, that's an extreme example. But the point is that it shifts things around. And of course, it's very devastating. Well, um, applying that to the concept of the earth, if the earth would be uh, a place that should be stable for us, that we can keep our feet on the ground, then an earthquake would be something that throws us into confusion or um, will we'll, we'll knock things all over the place in a metaphorical way. Um, when I was watching documentaries about the Second Vatican Council, I was watching interviews by certain uh, bishops and prelates um, that would they would give their thoughts a, a decade after the council or five years after the council or things like that. And I remember hearing once or twice at least, um, they described the Second Vatican, Vatican Council as an earthquake. And so they used, they used it themselves in a metaphorical way. But wow, does that make sense? Because boy, oh boy, did it shake things up quite a bit. And in and, and people who even say, oh, that, was a, that shook things up quite a bit. So looking at the apocalypse that way, that gives us a whole new perspective on these earthquakes in the apocalypse. It is a shakeup of the established order of the earth. And again, if the earth is God's land or God's place, so to speak, right? Um, Vatican II truly was an earthquake. And you could also see other earthquakes might be something like Amoris Laetitia, how that got everything all shaken up again and everyone is, is an upheaval. So that's very, very likely. All right. Now, um, there are a mention of, of trees or, or the grass or vegetation in the apocalypse from time to time. But um, the concept, I think, is very interesting as well because um, trees, excuse me, I think it's hot in here. I have the heat turned up too much. Um, trees will um, give fruit and uh, give shelter. Uh, they, 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 of course, they start off very small, but then they get bigger and bigger. Certain trees get bigger than others, and certain trees give more fruit than others, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are very types, many different types of trees, obviously, nut trees, fruit trees, et cetera. All right. But trees only grow on the earth. They don't grow in the sea. And they start off very small, and they have to be planted but once they're planted, they can grow. They can grow. Um, so if you look through uh, church history, um, uh, and if you look at you know our, our current time as well, perhaps, um, what would make sense possibly, again, this is all my speculation, but I, I do think that I'm on to something, or if, if not me, uh, this idea has been presented perhaps somewhere else. I haven't been able to find it yet. But um, a tree would very likely be something like a religious order. For instance, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, they had a specific uh, starting point by St. Francis. He planted the tree, he started it, and he watered it, and he took care of it when it was very, very little, and then it grew. 
grew beautifully until this magnificent religious order that covered most of the earth. The earth would be the Catholic nations of the world at the time. You'd have Franciscan branches. The branches of the Franciscan order would branch out into different countries, kingdoms, right? And the fruit would be wonderful because um, it would produce fruit in time. In time, it produced much fruit. And it also produced much shade. Um, shade could be a place of uh, um, comfort, for instance. Uh, not, not literal comfort, but some kind of... Um, mental uh, uh, comfort. It's, it's a place where you can go rest um, and, um, and not be in any in kind of intense uh, heat. It's hard for me to envision what that might mean. But, but um, anyway, so here you have different trees. You have Dominican trees and Franciscan trees and Augustinian trees and all kinds of religious orders and plants and bushes and shrubs all over the earth. So the earth is highly vegetated in the mid Middle Ages. But as time goes on, the trees start to wither or the, the, the grass is burnt up, right? And, and when you read the apocalypse, that's what you read. You read the destruction of the vegetation. One third of the trees were destroyed or the grass was burnt and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can see the apocalypse is almost like an undoing of God's creation. There are seven, there's a cycle of seven in the book of the apocalypse all the time. The seven trumpets, seven vials, the seven seals, seven churches, right? And of course, the story of creation takes place in seven days. So. Um, it's almost like things are being undone in the apocalypse. Um, and that's a whole other broadcast, and that's probably too much for my competence, but I'm just throwing the ideas out there at the people that are much smarter than me, um, who might have already thought of this or seen this or heard of this before. But um, if not, then um, maybe you could pursue it as well. Okay, um, another major concept in the book of the apocalypse is a king. It's talked, uh, the, the term king is thrown around quite a bit. And this is somebody who rules over the earth. Right. Uh, typically, king, kings don't uh, claim any jurisdiction over the sea. Uh, we have um, they have wealth and power. And they can be just and unjust. So um, the kings of the earth is a term that's used quite often in the book of the apocalypse. If you know what the earth is, you know what a king is. You can see who might be the kings of the earth. It could be uh, prelates, for instance. It's anyone who uh, would would wield uh, a lot of power and influence over the quote earth obviously. All right. And then what else do I have here? Oh, okay. Here's a major one. Um, so, um, well, first right, let me go through, I have, I have three more of these. And then after we do these, I'm going to go th through the text of select portions of the apocalypse. Also select portions of the, the messages of Our Lady of La Salette, who used apocalyptic language quite a bit. And as well, various verses of sacred scripture alert the words of our Lord. Our Lord talks about signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars towards the end, and the roaring of the sea. He mentions the same exact words. We can also go to um, uh, passages in the book of Isaiah. Actually, these terms are all over sacred scripture. They appear all over the Old Testament in, in books from Ezekiel to Isaiah to you name it. Um, our Lord mentions them quite a bit as well. And they're also in the parables and the metaphors of our Lord or the stories that happen, for instance. For instance, when, when St. Peter's on the boat on the sea, it mentions the word sea. And he goes out to meet our Lord walking on the water. He starts to fall into the sea. And our Lord, you know, says, if you, you have a little faith, and he lifts St. Peter up out of the sea. I don't know exactly what all that means, but I'm starting to think that it has profound meaning not only on the surface of the face of it, you know, the, the, the obvious lesson there is have faith in our Lord and you can do, you can do the impossible, but there's a deeper understanding as you get into a metaphorical understanding of these, of these things, right? So um, it's just another way of seeing this in a more beautiful, complete way that is based again on the Old Testament, right? Which makes sense. It makes sense that that if we had to pick one thing to, to, to extrapolate meaning from, it would be sacred scripture in the first revelation of God, the first testament, the Old Testament, the Old Testament people of God, their whole story. Um, but um, I, I digress again. Uh, let's go on to uh, the woman. Okay, this is a very key term in the apocalypse. It's used many times. And it's also a term that we find in Genesis as well, where the you know, uh, God will tell the woman that um, her foot will crush the serpent's head. The seed, of the, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And Our Lady is called the woman by our Lord in, in the Gospels. So the term the woman is very impactful. It has a certain connotation and a meaning to it that is scripture-based. 
Um, the, the woman, of course, is the bride of man. In the book of the Apocalypse, it's, um, I think it's chapter 17, at the very end, I believe it's verse 18, if my memory serves me right, we are told that the woman, specifically the woman in the book of the Apocalypse, is the great city. And also, of course, the, a woman will bear children. So, um, the bride of Christ is a woman, it's a bride. Um, now that, if we are told is a woman is a great city, uh, I think that also can be seen in a broad, broad way, but, but specifically, the great city would be Rome. Rome would be the great city of, of um, antiquity, and also it's central to church history. And so, um, but in a broader sense, I would definitely say that the great city would represent, for instance, Jerusalem in the Old Testament. And I can show that, I'll show that in a minute, when we go through the images from the Old Testament itself, you'll see that that it is a parallel. Rome is a parallel of Jerusalem. Okay, but um, it is simply a, a, also a manner of speaking. Um, it could also seem. It could also mean the church, the great city. It's a uh, uh, Saint Augustine uh, calls. Uh, he has the book um, City of God, and so he's not talking about a specific city only. He's talking about um, two places where. The, the seeds of Satan will dwell, the Satan's children, and the seeds of God, God's children will dwell. And on earth, in this present life, we exist together like the weeds and the wheat, the, the tares and the wheat. But um, um, So, um, this is, again, this is a very broad way of understanding things. So, uh, if I, uh, just let your mind relax a little bit and don't, don't look for, you know, specific things and look for contradictions um, because it's more poetic than anything. But, um, okay, now if, if we can say that about a woman, and we know from the apocalypse that specifically in that text, uh, the woman is the great city, then we have another uh, uh, image, it's the whore of Babylon, which also is a woman, but it's a woman orientated a different way, obviously. So, you know, here you have the corruption of the great city, obviously. It's an unfaithful woman, full of vice and corruption, focused on money and wealth. For traditional Catholics, we very much can see the great city of Rome is now the whore of Babylon. That is almost completely clear. And when we read the book of the Apocalypse further, boy, does that really resonate as true. Because, you know, for the first time in church history, you have Rome, well, you have Catholic Rome um, apostatizing. They've lost the faith. As our, our Lady of La Salette said in 1846, Rome will lose the faith. And how you have Archbishop Lefebvre said, um, Rome has lost the faith. It is sure, sure, sure. And what we're referring to are any number of, of occurrences, but you can look to things like the 1986 World Day of Peace by John Paul II, where he invited representatives of almost all the major world's religions, voodoo, paganisms of all kind, animists, various shades of Protestants, Jews, Muslims, all together to Assisi, and they were all worshiping their false gods in his presence with his blessing. That is apostasy. Um, the church would never have done something like that uh, in the past um, before Vatican II. And, you know, the there's tons of examples. It, it continues, and, and it filters down to the diocesan level, where you'll have most most every single diocese in the world, I would say, would host interfaith uh, prayer services and things like that. So here you have uh, an unfaithful woman. You have a bride who has gone off to other other gods, so to speak. Um, uh, and, and often, you know, um, whores are, are concerned about gaining money, wealth, position, power, prominence. And the trade-off is to sell herself for those things. And so um, um, there's a whore, obviously. And, and I'm, I'm going to get into those in the Old Testament here in a minute. I just have one more to cover. I just want to throw this out there. This is also something that's um, interesting, very uh, big image. And the apocalypse is a beast. So you have um, the seven-headed beast from the sea. The two-horned lamb is, is also considered a beast. Um, beasts will roam either the earth or the sea. But uh, their nature is different on land than it is in the sea, obviously. They're often very ravenous, and, and, and they're often eating things, um, just to, you know, because they're so, uh, they're carnivorous usually, I guess. And they're aggressive, aggressive. Um, now, this is, uh, admittedly, this is something that's hard for me to wrap my head around in terms of how it metaphorically relates. But seeing that, um, that uh, Daniel described these empires as four beasts from the sea, then 
I can I can kind of see perhaps how um, different political movements or um, empires or governments could be classified as a beast. Um, the Soviet communism sure was carnivorous and aggressive. Um, that could be seen as a beast as well. Uh, you could have um, all kinds of different beasts. Some of some of the beasts perhaps aren't aggressive or carnivorous. They're just very docile. You know, you might have some small uh, political groups or, or, or governments around that that perhaps are not so uh, destructive. So, um, um, but um, again, even even if I don't have the exact meanings for these things, uh, it doesn't necessarily. It's not bad because they're accessible to us all. So, you know. Um, it's just simply a matter of applying the concept and extrapolating. All right. Now, uh, saying all that, hopefully that I wasn't too onerous. I only have nine minutes left. Oh, my goodness. How did that happen? Okay. I have to hurry. All right. Oh, boy. Let's see where I'm at here. All right. Well, all right. these are verses from the Apocalypse where I'm just going to show you where the words are used. And um, what I want to draw attention to is the similarities between the text here and the text of the Old Testament. So remember Daniel 7, which I didn't show you. Let me put that on the screen real quick so you can see it. Um, Daniel uh, chapter 7 uh, mentions this. It says that, um, uh, here we go. Uh, it says that, I think it's coming, right? I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts, different from one another, came up out of the sea. So in the remaining time that I have left, what I want to demonstrate is that the uh, the imagery in the apocalypse, al almost, I would say all of it, although I don't know for sure, is taken right from the Old Testament. The same images are used. They're just reused in the apocalypse with a slightly different context, but almost the same. And, you know, this is from the apocalypse here. You have a beast coming out of the sea, you see. And so, um, and there's another beast coming up out of the earth, which is the two-horned lamb beast. That's chapter, uh, verse 13 at the bottom. Now, uh, what do we have next? Um, here's the, here's the imagery from, uh, the whore of Babylon. And it tells you, uh, again, I mentioned I was correct. It's, uh, uh, the very bottom there, chapter 17, verse 18. The woman which thou sawest is the great city. Now, going to the Old Testament version of that, let's see if I have it. I don't. I'm going to have to read it to you because, uh, well, no, I do have it. All right. Right. Okay. Um, so, we're told that the whore of Babylon is the great city and that, uh, um, and we know, uh, you know, a whore is, is a prostitute or, you know, fornicates. Look at this. This is this is from the book of Ezekiel. What do I have here? Um, let's see. It is from Ezekiel uh, chapter 23, verses 1 to 4. And it says that um, there are two women, daughters of our one mother. Uh, they committed fornication. And that um, it tells you the two cities that they're talking about is Jerusalem and Samaria. So here you have God's city, God's bride, Jerusalem, right? That's that's God's people, his bride. He calls them, um, in essence, a fornicator, which is is you can is, is a whore. So if 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 you have Jerusalem being described that way, then boy, the parallel for Jerusalem in, in church history is Rome, and there you have the whore of Babylon. Um, you have there's I go, there's so many there's so many. I, I probably should go on to. Our Lady of Lost Let really quickly. Oh, this is here's our Lord talking about the earth and the sun and the stars. And this is from uh, Gospel of Luke, verse 20, uh, chapter 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars upon the earth distress of nations by reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea. Now, um, if we understand the sun to be perhaps the papacy and the moon perhaps to be the reflection of truth by governments or other institutions uh, for us to have, uh, or and the stars would be something like, for instance, Catholic doctrines, or perhaps bishops or priests, then the heavens have fallen away after Vatican II. Now, traditional Catholics will recognize there are places out there where you could go to still receive Catholic truth, different uh, traditional Catholic groups of various kinds. But the nature of things in the sky is that everyone can see them no matter where you are on the earth. 
And a lot of these, I would say almost all these traditional Catholic groups are hidden from the general uh, populace. When I was uh, still in the Novus Ordo, I didn't know about any of them. I never have heard of them before. They weren't visible to me. Um, so the sun, the moon, and the stars sure have fallen out of the sky because it, it's very hard to find anything that's universal that could be guide, that guide people with, from just looking up and having it accessible, visible to them. And they have fallen from the sky. Um, the earth is in distress in a metaphorical way. And the sea, which is the secular world right now, sure is raging, <laughs> all right? Uh, but because it rages all the time, I guess. Uh, there is so much to cover still. Okay, let's go a little bit to Our Lady of La Salette, or I can show you how this seems to be. Here's her um, her words about the stars, the wandering stars. And then, um, you know, she mentions here in the bottom paragraph, the chief, the leaders of the people of God, have neglected prayer and penance. And the devil has bedimmed their intelligence. They have become wandering stars. Look at the word bedimmed. You know, that's a uh, dimming of a star. A star is bright, and if it becomes less bright, it's dimmed. It's bedimmed. Bedimmed their intelligence. And so the devil will drag them along with his tail. That reminds you of the apocalypse when the dragon sweeps away one-third of the stars from the sky and they fall to the earth. So no longer are they fixed in place in the sky, but now they've fallen down. And it says in there, like, a, a fig tree will lose its figs when a when wind will shake it. All the figs fall off. That's, that's the metaphor the apocalypse uses for that particular uh, image. There is just literally so much. Uh, we have here is... Here's another, uh, some other words, select words from Our Lady of La Salette's prophecy. The church will be in eclipse. There's an image of the sun, the light being covered up, right? Um, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. If you understand the earth to be God's people, God's land, God's place, then Vatican II was a destruction of the earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. In this time, the sun is darkening. Only faith will survive. So, you know, understanding her words metaphorically with these images in mind, and like I've said, you can use the same application of these things all throughout scripture. Boy, meanings just pop out all over the place. Here's another one from the book of Isaiah. Let's see if I can find... Yes, all right, this is also extremely interesting, I think. Isaiah 24. Behold, the Lord shall lay waste to the earth, and shall strip it, and shall afflict the face thereof, and scatter abroad the inhabitants. With desolation shall the earth be laid waste. In verse 5, and the earth is infected by the inhabitants thereof. The earth is infected by the inhabitants of the earth. So it's the inhabitants of the earth that infect it. And that's what Catholics did to themselves in Vatican II. We have, um, what else? Is, uh, this one was very astonishing to me as well. Here you have... Um, what, what caught my, we're almost out of time here, so I'm going to just go to the very bottom. All right, okay. Uh, for it shall, I'll start at the top. For it shall be thus in the midst of the earth, in the midst of the people, as if a few olives that remain should be shaken out of the olive tree or grapes when the vintage is ended. Here we go. These shall lift up their voice and shall give praise when the Lord shall be glorified. They shall make a joyful noise from the sea. Why would they be in the sea? Unless it's a metaphorical understanding. Why would God's people just be standing or swimming in the ocean? doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if you understand um, that the earth, I guess, would be, like I said, God's place, God's people, and the the, uh, the water in the sea would be a, kind of a way of understanding secular countries and secular uh, societies, then um, as the centuries have gone by throughout church history, the water level has been rising like at Noah's flood. Our Lord said the end of days will be like the days of Noah. Well, that is true, I'm sure, in many ways, not just in the way that we perhaps think. It's also true in many ways. So here you have the water levels have been rising because Catholic countries, Catholic monarchies, uh, Catholic lands have been being taken over. And, and most of that happened, um, well, a big portion of it happened in the Protestant revolt, but that continued to happen through the French Revolution. Catholic monarchies were deposed and, and, and ended all throughout Europe. And one of the last ones left was the Papal States, which also was was uh, confiscated in 1870. But then, of course, a, a small portion was given back in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty. But the point here is, is that 
um, it's been rising. So God's people, the only ones that are left, it says like a couple olives that are still hanging on to the vine after it's all over, because only a couple left, they're going to sing God's praises from the sea, from the islands of the sea down below. And out there, who of you out there, traditional Catholics or faithful, uh, you know, people who want to be a faithful Catholic, who are trying very hard, do you feel like you're submersed in the sea? I do. I felt that many times. And boy, does it really ring true in my brain from personal experience. You feel like your house is a little sanctuary in a vast ocean of paganism and immorality. You're swimming in the sea. Okay, with that, I probably should go. I have a lot more to cover, but we'll have to do it at a different time because I'm out of time. Um, if you're interested in, in, in more of these, I have a lot more. Um, and it, I, I, I just picked a couple examples. I mean, it, the sacred scripture is just filled with those terms, the sea and the earth. Um, okay, I should, I should cut it out. I just want to say, as always, make sure you always pray the rosary and pray it a lot and wear your scapular. Uh, and God bless you. So uh, have a wonderful Immaculate Conception feast. Thank you. Bye.